And welcome, delighted to be here uh, today, uh, introduction, uh, this wonderful book on global fintech and uh, David, uh, of course, with, with Alex and, and several other uh, contributors, uh, because it actually connects to, you know, the way that we've been thinking about the strategic development of the school in, in many different ways. And this is why, you know, I'm particularly excited to be, you know, uh, presenting the book uh, today. So we uh, a, a few years ago, when we were thinking about kind of our strategic direction and the, the way that we think about our future and some of the things that we think we can build in a differentiated way inside the business school here at Imperial, one of those is what we could think of as future finance, right? So what do we mean this future finance? And this is actually inspired on a speech that Mark Carney, the previous governor of the Bank of England, gave in, I think, 2018 or 2018, certainly pre-COVID. Uh, Pre-COVID time, it was not a, a remote. It was not a remote, uh, a remote speech, and he was talking about this future finance in a very interesting way that reflected the way that finance is changing in very fundamental ways. And this is quite pertinent to us for the business school here at Imperial, because you know we of course have a very strong finance department. You know, had uh, for a long time. You know, we teach you know 600 students every year in the area of finance. So thinking about how finance is changing, how finance is evolving, is of course very important for what we do as an academic institution, as a research-led institution, and as an institution that wants to engage with, with, the broader, with the broader community. But one of the things that's quite important when we think about it and when we reflect on this notion of future finance is certainly not to box it <coughs> within just specific finance profession itself. Because one of the fundamental changes that is happening around finance is a complete upheaval of the structure of finance in so many different ways and the connection of finance to other areas. Certainly the technology element here, and even if we think about here at Imperial, of course we have a very strong finance department in the business school, but we have a center for you know crypto in the engineering school. We have a very strong mathematical finance uh, group in uh, the Faculty of Natural Sciences. So it is much more dispersed already, and in particular in a way that connects to the more technological elements of finance. And so the data revolution and the way that the data revolution is, is evolving and the technologies that is enabling is a very important part of the way that finance is changing. And therefore, to have a book that's talking about, you know, the go global fintech and how's that helping to power and connect many things around the world is quite important. And we're seeing that in a variety of ways. So some of the things that we're doing when we think about finance and future finance is precisely to say, no, we need to think about what's happening in finance also in the way that it's changing, you know, organizational, structurally, and in the way that it can connect to other areas. And that's certainly true, for example, on the work that we're doing connecting finance with climate change to look, for example, at how, you know, finance needs to change in fundamental ways to be able to tackle uh, net, um, uh, net zero, how we're thinking about finance and development, a very important theme as well that's covered uh, on the book. And you know, and we have you know, other faculty members that have been looking at, for example, how you know, the change in finance and fintech in particular can unlock you know, the, two, the several billion people that are unbanked at the moment that could all of a sudden have access to financial products, financial services in a way that's completely impossible today when we have a system mostly relying on banks and on the way that as banks as a, an anchor for the way that the financial system works in many different uh, in many different ways. And so, once we start to think about these, that means, of course, making sure that our students and our faculty member, our academics that are working in finance, are at the cutting edge of this transition. And that's why we have a center on fintech, for example, that's part of the um, hosted by the the, the finance uh, department. That's we have uh, a center on climate finance. Uh, investment uh, and management is another uh, example, and we have you know faculty members that are working on things like you know the application of machine learning to finance, or we're talking about, for example, how uh, automated dec decision making you know connects and is affected, uh, or can create, for example, a variety of biases. But one thing that is really really important is precisely to look at these beyond the context of just the finance and the financial sector and understand that there are very important transformations associated to business models, to the way that we even think about what finance are, is, the way that finance is organized, right? I mean, a much more decentralized 
uh, environment for finance that is allowed by, 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 thing, by, by technologies such as the blockchain will be fundamentally a very different organizational and, and sectoral uh, uh, element. And therefore, thinking about that is no longer just the purview of the finance sector, is a purview of the organizational uh, part of the business model elements uh, of things, of the behavior aspects that are, is behind that. And that, of course, then starts to connect to a variety of other different areas within the business school, certainly our management and entrepreneurship department, you know, our analytics management, um, uh, marketing and, and, and operations group, as well as economics and public policy, which are the other three departments in the school. So one of the very nice things about the book and the work that's behind here is precisely the ability to connect these various elements and not take necessarily just a finance perspective, but to think about what does this mean? to us? What does this mean for development? What does this mean for the way that technology is developed, for the way that it's deployed, for the way that it touches the lives of peoples that affects the structure of organizations and the fundamentals of the way the sectors, <coughs> the sectors go? So all of these and several and many other things are at the basis of, of the book here. And so, of course, the way that we do and have these activities is through, of course, our research and the academics that we have, through the education, that, um, uh, that we put in place through our programs, certainly in finance, but beyond, but also through our centers. And I've already mentioned a couple of the centers that we have that touch this space, but one, of course, that is very fundamental is our Center for Digital Transformation that, um, that uh, David, uh, together with Chris Tucci, have been really pushing forward and, and helping for, to develop. And this center is precisely this very important complementary aspect that we see in the role of the school, which is to engage. I mean, when we think about change, when we think about transformation, it is quite important that we be humble enough to realize that some of these transformations are happening much ahead of academia, and we need to engage with what's happening around us to understand what are the challenges, what are the opportunities, to make sure that not only we're providing answers that are meaningful and relevant to what's happening around us, but sometimes even more importantly, to make sure that we're asking the right questions to understand it, are we looking at the right problems or should we be looking at the problem in a, in, a different, in a different way? And so the work that we do through our, through our centers, in particular Center for Digital Transformation, is precisely to look at that and to understand and look at sectors, organizations, areas, and to have a better understanding how this transformation, which is in the, in the basis of the, of the center, is really taking place and making sure that we bring that back to the research and to the education that we, that, we, that we bring. And certainly the work that David has been making with us beyond this book in his role as a, as a professor of practice, as a, as a leader in a variety of educational uh, settings, you know, from degree programs to executive education is a, is a wonderful example uh, of this. And so I'm absolutely delighted to be here today you know, welcoming you all, you know, thanking um, David for his many contributions and uh, thanking David and Alex, the other co-author together with a variety of, uh, of others for the wonderful work that is in, in this book on how this, um, you know, uh, we can see this, this financial innovation that's changing this, this connected world. So, you know, enjoy the rest of the session, the conversation, the dialogue, the provocation, as I said, I mean, if we're here to think about are we asking the right questions, then it is important that we get your questions and to challenge about the assumptions that we that, that we're using to make sure that the next the next set of questions that we ask are really you know addressing some of the challenges that we're seeing uh, today as well as some of the opportunities i mean bringing a three trillion dollars into a, a much more you know green finance or bringing a couple of billion people into the financial into the financial sector is amazingly important um, you know, contribution that we can have. And so if we're doing things in a way that can contribute to, to, to these and to other opportunities, it's certainly something that can make a big difference um, in the world. So thank you very much. Congratulations again, and um, enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. So, I'm going to invite Tom Allen down here to join me up on the stage. Thank you. Tom is a, uh, the editor of AI Journal and uh, Thank you. a long-time friend of Imperial uh, and uh, has been a guest speaker in our AI startups class. Yeah, yeah. really appreciate it. So good to see you. Now. So let's get him mic'd up and then uh, we thought it would be more interesting to have a conversation about the book rather than have me bore you to death with PowerPoint slides and force you to listen to you know slide after slide. So 
So let's chat. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this. It's, uh, it's a great book and it's a great situation to be here to talk around it and uh, some very pressing topics at the moment with fintech. We see it all the time at AI Journal with people writing about it from different banks and different industries that haven't been in the area before, but are really starting to consider it. And what a timely topic to bring in this book. So really excited to delve into it. So I do these interviews quite often. And the, when I'm looking at people that have written books and books that I'm really keen on, that really match timely situation, I always want to ask why, why the book? What, what, was, what was the reason behind it? What made you drive to think, or what gave you that drive to think this is something that needs to be out there for people to learn from? Yeah, well, so, so there's a bit of a story here. And, and so if, if you'll indulge me for, for a couple of minutes, uh, um, several years ago, so this is probably 2014, uh, I, was, uh, I was doing some work at, at MIT and uh, I was sitting in my office, uh, I get up to go to the coffee machine, uh, talking to a colleague at the coffee machine and a, a, a young uh, business student comes in and says, you know, I started the FinTech club last week. Okay, she says, 150 people signed up in a week. Oh, that's good, good for you. She says, why don't we have a FinTech startup class? I said, well, I don't know, why don't we have it? She said, well, I talked to so-and-so and, -so and they're too busy, they told me to go away. Uh, well, you guys teach entrepreneurship classes here at the Media Lab, why don't you do it? Um, and my colleague who's getting coffee with me, Yost Bonson says to me, uh, well, I'm teaching six classes this fall, so I definitely don't have time. Um, and I say to the student, well, I got a lot of other stuff going on, I'm working on these things over here, so I really, I'm, I'm too busy. She refused to leave our office until we agreed to teach the class, okay? Um, she's now a fairly prominent figure in, in the crypto and blockchain world, uh, Meltem Demers. Uh, she shows up a lot on CNBC, so. Uh, but then she was an MBA student. She was very insistent, refused to, to, to leave our office until we agreed, agreed to teach class. So this is a great lesson for those of you who are students here in the room, uh, which is, you know, there's a lot you can get out of your experience at a major institution if you insist on it. <laughs> and don't take no for an answer. Um, so, so we start teaching the class, and the, the first day of class, uh, there's three people sitting there at the turn of the hour. And I say to Yost, uh, I don't know, do we have to cancel class? And he says, no, no, just, just wait, just wait. A few more people trickle in. About five minutes after the hour, there's seven people there. I say, gee, Yost, I don't know. Are we going you know, to minimum eight is, is our, our floor for being able to hold a seminar? He said, just wait. So by 15 minutes after the hour, we had 68 students in a classroom intended for 30. Uh, they were spilled out in the hallway, standing up at the back, craning their heads over the crowd. Um, and that was the start of this great fintech class. And about three weeks into teaching it, some entrepreneurs come into my office and they say, we want to put it online. OK, sure. Um, a lot of interesting history behind why that was a controversial choice to go with them. But, but we put the thing online and we ended up with now between uh, uh, the original MIT class and its successor at Oxford and the various iterations, <laughs> we had over 20,000 students in 150 countries. But to get there, we had to have some stuff to, to tell them. We had us talking on video, so we would, you know, we would talk, but we needed some materials to go with the class. Um, and we looked around, and in 2015, there wasn't really a good book on fintech. Uh, so Sandy Pentland, the professor at MIT who I worked with to, to put this class together, and I kind of cobbled together some white papers that we were writing like week by week. As class was going, we'd write a new white paper and then give it to the students and say, here, here's the next reading assignment. Um, and by you know, the end of the term, we had a stack of white papers, and I'm carrying them back from the printer. Yeah, I was killing trees. I'm carrying back this pile of paper from the printer, and a colleague of mine says to me, Geez, that looks like a book. You should publish a book. Um, so we put out the, the first book in 2016. Um, and and uh, the book and the class together, they kind of grew up together. It, it was a little like a barn raising. Does, does everyone know what a barn, barn raising is? So as you can tell, I'm an American. Uh, in, in the frontier times in America, when you know a, a rural community, someone would move to the community and they'd set up their farm. Um, they have to put up a barn so they could keep their animals. And so, you know, a young family of settlers, you know, they, they couldn't physically build the barn by themselves. So everyone in the community would come together. Some people would bring nails and hammers and glue and wood, and they'd all come together. And in a day, they'd build a barn. And then the family would be able to start their farm. And, and the class was a lot like that because it wasn't just me and Sandy sort of blathering away on video saying, oh, here's, here's how FinTech works. Uh, we got a whole bunch of guest speakers from around the world 
who contributed to the class. We probably had 50 guest speakers, which is a great thing about doing stuff online because you know, during the semester, if I get 10 guest speakers in class, I'm thrilled. Online, you can have 50 guest speakers, 50 perspectives from government, from, from industry, from nonprofit, from academia, from all these different walks of life telling you about a subject. And so when we put the book together, it was the same exercise. We got a lot of different expert perspectives who contributed to understanding this thing called FinTech. And so it was, it was probably, it was right at the beginning of COVID, I think, just before COVID started. I was talking to my uh, editor in chief at MIT Press and she said, well, what's your next book? And I said, well, you know, it's been a while since we wrote that original FinTech book and it's time for an update. Um, and so now, you know, two years later, uh, uh, we have our updated uh, global FinTech book, uh, but we were able to bring together again, a lot of these really brilliant people from you know, regulators who are crafting legislation, governing FinTech to uh, uh, entrepreneurs who are helping the entire continent of Africa to kind of take advantage of the new free trade agreement using FinTech uh, to you know, senior executives at major corporations who you know, touch a billion lives through their products and services. And so decisions they make about things like digital privacy and your finances impact a huge segment of the global population. So those are some of the, the folks who helped us raise this barn. Love it. I love it when a story comes from a natural process of just seeing it, thinking this should turn into a book. This is something we should cover. And when I'm on a panel, I always like to ask people or in a discussion, I always think, like you were saying, when you bring people from different backgrounds together, yeah. you get such a different idea of what it is. And I'm a massive fan of everything being open source and collaboration. And whenever I go into a room, we're focused across cloud, AI, all these different topics. I always say, and I've all, well, I've occasionally heard the same response. I ask people, what is AI? And the answer I get is different every time. And it always <laughs> amazes me to think what someone sees of it because the following week, so it might happen. But that leads me to my next question. So I want to know, and you kind of got the framework for how it came together. Yeah. How did you choose what perspectives or what threads of conversation to include? How did you get that together? And how did you put it into the book across these, uh, across the chapters in the book? Yeah, well, uh, so, so it, like so many things that we do, it, it was a mix of push and pull, right? So we, we had some ideas of things that we wanted to cover or things that we missed, right? So the first time we did the book, we didn't want to just repeat everything that we talked about the first time. You know, things we missed, like, for example, um, uh, everyone's very focused on the future, and, and that's exciting. I spend my time as a futurist thinking about and building the future, but, but it, you can't leave behind the world we're all living in and coming from. And so Boris Kentov is the SVP of operations for Betterment, which is one of the largest robo-advisors in the world. And, and what he revealed to us and what he talks about in his chapter in the book is about how uh, uh, hard it is to bridge from the old mechanical world that, that financial services was built on, which is frankly some fairly creaky foundations, into this exciting new digital world of AI systems telling you how to invest your money. Um, and by the way, I should mention, uh, as a reward for coming out tonight, uh, but you don't have to stay through the entire talk, uh, we have free copies for the book for you outside. So uh, be sure to pick one up uh, when you leave, but, but I have to be out there for you to get it. So, um, uh, but, but yeah, so, 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 uh, so that was one person is trying to look at this, these transition moments, right? Because there's a lot of value that gets created and harvested in what, in what I like to call night soil removal businesses. Right? It's not very glamorous, right? In the old days with cities, you know, people would have chamber pots and they'd toss them out their windows onto the street. And then someone would come along and shovel it up and put it in a wagon and take the wagon out to the farms and sell it to farmers. Yet not very glamorous, but it made a lot of money. <laughs> um, and, and there are those equivalencies in, in the fintech world that, you know, the, the, the typical uh, business school student doesn't usually think about because it's not as exciting and sexy as NFT, crypto marketplace derivatives, <laughs> but it is actually a place to make a huge amount of, of money. So uh, one of the big four banks here in the UK, for example, has the world's largest repository of trade finance data, right? This is 30% global market share, right? Think about what that data, guess what that data is stored up? Paper. <laughs> they have 100 million documents, not pages, documents that are sitting there with all this data. So they have all this data, they can't do anything with it because it's in analog form. And there's a massive digitization project underway. That is not a business that looks exciting when you've been reading about Board Ape Yacht Club. But the people running that project are going to make 
hundreds of millions of dollars in profits off of helping this bank digitize the old world and bring it forward into the new world. Um, and so Boris talks about that. Um, but we also wanted to bring some more global perspectives, right? So the first, the first cut at the book was, was very uh, um, US centric even. It didn't even talk enough about Europe. And so we tried to bring some more kind of global perspectives in, into the conversation as well. Yeah, and I think that's such an important point just to go back on that because when I was looking at FinTech at times, you can see it just targeted to one sector or one area yeah. and not really seeing it. So I think that's a great way that you're really getting that global perspective and seeing how yeah. one aspect might challenge something in Europe, one aspect in Europe might challenge something in Asia. And it's such a big part to play today. And, and I will advocate that uh, like blockchain is a subset of FinTech. Right, this Web3 stuff is, is one part of a much bigger market. And, and what's exciting for me about it is that it democratized where innovation happens. Yeah. Okay, so traditionally, tech was, eight, before China built its own venture capital community, 80% of tech VC was in a 20 mile radius around Sand Hill Road in California. Mm -hmm. Then what the Web3 revolution brought was companies springing up everywhere. You have entrepreneurs living in 100 countries who are starting businesses that have global footprints. I met a guy at uh, um, Davos a couple of weeks ago who his company is doing $200 million of revenue in the meta, uh, dollar revenue, actual revenue, uh, with a metaverse game. And I couldn't tell you where he actually lives. I think he's a digital nomad. <laughs> Just hiding away, just playing the games and making it. But, but you can amazing. do that because yeah. of this sort of democratization of capital. Yeah, we well, look I mean, at everything like working today and being a, like with the AI journal, I use it as an example. There was a long time I didn't meet anyone I was working with. And I right. thought, how, how have I done this? Like, are oh, you yeah. meeting people across the world? And I think, I it's think this is the first point. time we've met in person. Actually. Yeah, yes. it is. It's this the first time we've met in person. First time we've been together and we, we've go. done talks. He's spoken in my class, but this is our first time meeting face to face. It's always amazing to meet new people when we're going to conferences. But I want to look at it from whenever you do something new, and I know this is a rebuild from what you've done before and a new addition and a great new addition to it, but when you do something new, there's always surprises. And I don't like the word surprises. And I, if someone says they like surprises, I say, well, I think you're a liar. Then they go, no. And I'm like, well, do you like problems? They're like, no. And I'm like, well, problems are just surprises. You're the ones you just don't like. But when you look at it, you have surprises and you have lessons from it. So I'd love to know what your lessons were and what did you learn from writing this book and putting the chapters through it? Yeah, well, so, so, so I spent a lot of time, uh, so, so just by context, I'm, I'm only a part-time academic, right? I spent a lot of time in the, uh, in the commercial world as well. Uh, uh, but, but something that I saw in both worlds and something that came through in putting the book together was, unfortunately, how relevant some of the basic chapters and information around regulation and fintech are today. You know, we covered this material eight years ago, and unfortunately, there's still a lot of education that has to happen with regulators. Uh, uh, because if we don't get good information into them, we're gonna get bad regulation out of it. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples. So 20-ish years ago, uh, there were some big accounting scandals in, in the large listed company world, and it caused the fall of Arthur Anderson, a major accounting firm. Enron uh, is a name which may uh, uh, spring to mind. Uh, and that led directly to some regulation called Sarbanes-Oxley or Sarbox, and Sarbanes-Oxley was intended to correct the excesses and the, and the, and the, the fraud that, that Enron and WorldCom and other companies engaged in and that Arthur Anderson helped perpetrate allegedly. And so, you know, whatever, there, there was an intent to fix this problem with regulation. And, and what's ironic is it was only a couple of years after some of the best and most enlightened regulation we had seen in many years, which was uh, the Clinton Magazine or e-commerce principles that allowed for the the birth of the e-commerce industry. So only two, many of the same people, only a couple of years after we had really good regulation around promoting e-commerce, we get this thing called Sarbanes-Oxley. And it had the unintended consequence along with market cons uh, consolidation of destroying the ability of young companies to raise money. Because the cost of compliance with Sarbanes-Oxley was so expensive that you could not go public if you were not already like a billion dollar plus market cap. So it eliminated a whole wave of small companies' uh, ability to access the, the public capital markets. And so now we flash forward to today. What does that have? That was 20 years ago. And what does it have to do today? Well, we're reading about the collapse of, of uh, Luna and TerraCoin, uh, which were a so-called stable coin, this sort of digital currency thing. And, and you would think this is a blip. I mean, candidly, this was a science experiment gone wrong. This is not a, a structural problem with the crypto world. But, but the headlines are 
you know, SCA plans to impose new regulations on fintech and blockchain, and specifically will deal with stable coins thanks to the Terra Luna coin. And I'm like, oh my God, it's just it, 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 regulators chasing headlines uh, uh, cause me heartburn. And it's particularly troublesome with the FCA, who has been very engaged in talking to the financial services industry, very engaged talking to crypto, startups, blockchain. They have very smart people working there. And so I meet the individual people at the FCA and say, all right, here are some regulators who are actually going to do some good here. And then you see headlines like this and, and spokespeople for the FCA saying they have to take action. And, and you wonder. Yeah. <laughs> but we do talk a lot, like a third of the book talks about uh, regulation, fintech, and how these things need to sort of work together in an enlightened fashion. And so whether you're a startup trying to figure out how to navigate regulation in fintech, or you're a regulator trying to figure out how to regulate, uh, we, we've got some pretty very important information for you. Nice. And some practical examples by the sounds of things as well to get Absolutely. your head stuck into. Yeah. So those are two topics I want to talk on. And I would you want to come back to them. Regulation is such a big point. And I mean, I saw this morning as my news update that those cryptocurrencies are down 20%. And you read through it and you're just thinking, what information am I actually going to get from this? That's actually yeah. helpful, right? Like, yeah. how am I going to feed that into I, what I'm I will, doing? I will blame the fourth estate for that headline, though, because, <laughs> you know, cryptocurrency is up. So Bitcoin was at $8,000 a year and a half ago. It's at 30000 today. Yeah. So when they say it's down 20%, I'm like, yes, but it's also up 400%. So, you know. It's not looking at innovation. You look where we were innovating 10 years ago, and now it's, yeah, we can't even yeah. keep up with it. But what kind of, before we go into that conversation, I'd like to know, what kind of trends do you see within fintech or as a wider market and actually having some sort of tangible benefit or some sort of example to businesses in the world today or to people, to consumers. Yeah. I look at FinTech and whenever, I think I've said the same to you, David, in previous conversations, they're one of the most exciting areas for me to look at because it taps into so much data, it can tap into so much of who you are and so much of what benefits it can bring. And I really see it going much, much wider. And I mean, I could chew your ear off about how it's such an exciting area, but I'd love to know from your angle, yeah. what are those trends that we're seeing and what impacts do they have? Uh, absolutely. Well, and, and uh, so I was having a conversation over dinner last night, and I see uh, my friend who I was having dinner with is here in the audience, so I'll not uh, name names. Um, and uh, 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 she said, you know, uh, FinTech's dead. It's all about Web3. <laughs> and, and it's like, all right, well, I, all right, like, uh, let's see where you're going with this. And she's actually right and wrong at the same time, which is always what's so fun. Uh, about being an academic is, is that I get to argue both sides of the same argument. Um, and so uh, um, she's right in that when you look forward, when you're trying to aim at future trends where there's more rapid growth curves going on, um, there, there is like a bigger delta in terms of percentage for where the sort of Web3 revolution is happening versus FinTech, because FinTech is already so pervasive. Yeah. But when you look at the sheer scale of FinTech, and I had to look this up, last year, the venture capital industry invested $125 billion into FinTech. Okay, that's up 280% from the year before. Now they're trying to fix, as, as uh, Francesco alluded to, a multi-trillion dollar system. So $125 billion <laughs> of investment is a tiny drop in the bucket relative to the size of the system it's trying to move. But nonetheless, right? so if you look at all financial assets, including real estate, you're looking at 250 or 300 trillion dollars that you're trying to move with 125 billion of venture investment. The other thing to remember is VC is investing for five to seven years into the future. Those investments they made in December, they're expecting to pay out seven years from now and they're expecting to make five or 10 times their money. So they're expecting to create a trillion dollars of value off of that 125 billion of investment. Um, so, so you know, fintech still has a lot going for it. And I, I also went back and looked at the 2014 and 2015 numbers. And everyone in 2015, and this was when we were putting the original antecedent to this together, everyone was uh, very excited about the fact that fintech investment was, who can guess what the level of investment was back then? Anyone? Shout out. $13.8 billion in, in 2015. So it's up almost 10x in, in eight years, roughly, yeah. seven years. And it's only going to go further up, I'd imagine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, and so, um, uh, so where's all that money going? I mean, what are, what are the problems we're solving? Well, 
we, we have a financial system that still has a lot of inefficiencies in it and deep problems in it, right? So if you've been following the whole battle with Citadel and Robin Hood and the subreddit Wall Street Bets, <laughs> it is worth reading up on this. But uh, basically, there are a bunch of hedge funds. Uh, uh, Melvin Capital went out of business. So a very sophisticated hedge fund with 13 billion, roughly billions of assets went out of business because they got into a public battle with a bunch of people on a community, a social media website. Yeah. And there were enough people on a social media website buying this stock that they blew up the short bet that the hedge fund had made against the stock. That was a fintech artifact, I would argue. But then some more stuff started coming out, which is that Robinhood, which was a trading platform they were using, was, was Basically, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak, uh, how do I say? I gotta say this advisedly. We are recording this. There are allegations in terms of uh, the potential of front running of trades, which is actually illegal in, in, in the US or in the securities markets and stock markets, um, where Robinhood was selling the trading data to Citadel before the trades were executed. So if you had an account- and Allegedly, this is what is reported on, in the press. So if you enter a trade in Robinhood, you're an individual day trader, you're trying to buy GameStop. And like Robinhood says, oh yeah, thanks, I'll take your trade. They wait 30 seconds while they transmit the data to Citadel saying, by the way, guess what? And then Citadel gets to trade ahead of you. So um, this is what is reported to have happened. I have not verified this independently, but it's an interesting artifact around FinTech. Yeah. Um, but what it speaks to also is some of the unexpected things that are happening when people start to really get into digitizing the financial services market. Um, and, and so if you're running Robinhood before this all came out, you felt pretty smart. You had figured out a way to collect millions of users, generate massive amounts of data, then generate metadata off of it, and then sell it to somebody else. Ethically, whether or not they should have done it is a different conversation. But from uh, creating something out of nothing and generating innovation off of looking at the financial services industry in a new way, what would have happened if Robinhood had actually used that data for good? Mm. Like what if Robinhood used that data and gave it back to the users and said, this is what you all are thinking as a group, yeah. right? There's an interesting business model and, and a lot of websites are actually, eToro does stuff like this, right? So it's what I think is, is, is a trend that yeah. Etoro on the good side and Robinhood on the bad side illustrate um, is this idea of collective intelligence and using AI and fintech to harvest wisdom of the crowds to reveal trading insights. So this is now putting democratized in finance, putting the insights that used to only be in the hands of the citadels of the world, of the big hedge funds, and giving it to the masses. Um, so that collective intelligence function is an existing trend that is continuing to grow, and I think an exciting one. Yeah, I like what you said as well, David, because if you look at it, the question I asked you earlier about the lessons learned, when all these situations happen, you don't know what's going to happen. I always say, I don't know what's going to happen from 10 years from now. I don't know what I'm going to have for dinner in three weeks from now. And you think of all these situations that are going to happen, there's a lot of lessons that can be learned from them. So I always look at it from an optimistic angle and think, well, although that wasn't great, what can we learn from it? And I think that's a, a brilliant viewpoint to have, especially in this area at the moment. And I want to come on to the topic of regulation now, because yeah. it's very fitting and it's yeah. a very good area. And... Personally, I mean, I'm for and against, and I just play the devil's advocate, I think, does regulation strict or does it hold back what are great technologies and applications it can have? I'm not saying yes, I'm not saying no, but I always like to pose an idea. Yeah. So I want to ask you, David, when you look at regulation, maybe not asking the question, do you think it will help, because that will be a very long-winded question, but where do you, or maybe lean into the that. Answer but where, maybe, but yeah, exactly, but <laughs> yeah, exactly. Where, where do you see regulation playing a role in this? Yeah. How, What's, what's its part to play, maybe, instead yeah. of how can it help, how it cannot? What's its part to play? No, I, absolutely. And I, and I spend a lot of time thinking about this question, right? So, so, so thanks to places like Imperial, with these amazing academic institutions, I'm able to work with regulators and help them think through regulation and not be viewed with suspicion the way I would be if I worked for Goldman Sachs or Barclays or some, you know, industry player, right? And so, so I've, I've probably worked with uh, uh, over 100 world governments on them trying to figure out fintech and blockchain regulation. Um, and, and here are the few things I've learned. Um, first of all, what is the purpose of it? So I knew the tech side and I learned from the regulators what, what, what good policy is all about, right? So, so first of all, um, uh, good policy should uh, manage risk, 
right? If you have a financial system that is overly risky and wildly like out of control, no one's going to want to put capital in your financial system. Okay, so manage risk. Um, you, you, you want systemic risk in particular, right? Um, two, uh, you want to protect consumers, right? Ken Griffin at Citadel or the guy from Melvin Capital, they don't need protection. These are very sophisticated individuals. But the average consumer who might have 50 quid in a pension pot or $1,000 in their day trading account that they're buying and selling stocks with, um, you know, that consumer needs protection a priori because they haven't had the benefit of all the training and all the data and systems and things that Ken Griffin at, at Citadel have. And so that's why you have rules in place that help protect small shareholders, that help protect day traders, that help protect kind of consumers from being gouged by some fintech app on their phone that lets them pay for things, right? So consumer protection, very important. Um, so so uh, manage systemic risk, protect consumers, promote stability. It kind of goes with the, the systemic risk idea, right? You want a, a stable financial system. If you have a currency that fluctuates a thousand percent a day, it's very hard for someone to feed their family because the paycheck that they got on Monday might not be enough to cover their bills on Friday. We're already having that problem in relatively stable economies with what's going on right now with inflation and, and uh, uh, energy prices and food prices. Um, and it's, it's not great here in the UK. It's very bad in some countries that have uh, less good uh, uh, regulatory uh, controls. Um, and finally, you also want to promote innovation, right? Regulators, believe it or not, like innovation. Innovation is good for everything else I just described, right? So innovation helps with things like increasing competition in the market sector, lowering costs. In 1985, if you wanted to buy or sell stock, you had to call up a broker at Merrill Lynch or HSBC on the phone and tell them, I would like to buy 10 pounds of you know, Boots PLC, please. And then they would go and they would put in a paper order and they'd like whatever, do a trade over the phone. Um, and it cost you, it might have cost you five or 10 pounds to do that 10 pound trade, maybe more, maybe 20 or 50 pounds to do a trade. And then electronic brokers, new competition entered the market. And suddenly, you could do trades for, for free or for you know, a, a, a few pence. Um, and so competition is good. And regulators like to see competition in a market. All right. So that's really a positive that, that they want to promote. And so we saw this. Uh, I personally saw this in 2014, where we held an academic conference that helped. Uh, uh, helped. I don't want to take sole claim on it. but dramatically helped avoid the US government from shutting down Bitcoin. Because in 2014, I think yeah. the market cap of Bitcoin was roughly $9 billion. Yeah. And um, uh, Silk Road was in the headlines, right? This dark web website where you could buy and sell children uh, or drugs or anything else. Like it was a lot of shady activity and people were using Bitcoin to do it. Mm. Um, but what we did is we held a conference that showed the regulators, it was off the record, one of the advantages of the convening power of academia, you can do stuff that's sort of out of the sight of the press and, and sort of public. Off the record, we brought together the regulators, the startups, the big companies, and academics. We said, all right, let's talk about this stuff. What is this stuff actually good for? The name of the conference was the Ecology of Digital Assets, Identity, Trust, and Data. And, and through that two-day event and, and some of the aftermath, we got the, all of the Bitcoin wallet companies at the time, there were 22 of them, we got all of them to adopt certain provisions into their terms of service that said, when we take on a new client, we will do this kind of AML KYC. We will do this kind of compliance to make sure that we're not doing business with drug dealers and money launderers. When the regulators saw this self-governing action by the industry, they said, okay, we wanna let innovation happen around the edges. This is still small. Let's see what happens. And they backed off because the Treasury, the, the Department of Justice, and something called FinCEN were getting ready to swoop in and shut down Bitcoin. And they backed off. And so that showed me, I, I helped Sandy uh, organize this conference. Yeah. That helped me see the power of getting the regulators into dialogue with industry in a way to promote enlightened action. In that case, there wasn't regulation. It was the the, the inaction that allowed innovation to happen.
but they were following good policy principles of we want to allow innovation to happen, the risk is managed, and therefore we'll allow this to proceed. Yeah, it's a great answer. And um, there's a lot at the moment, if anyone wants to look at it on, but um, well, there's a lot of films that kind of look at it, not from that perspective, but I mean, you can see the kind of risks of it. There's films that come to my mind. You can obviously watch ones that are more popular, but things like Margin Call, and there's a lot of ones that are on Netflix at the moment, although they don't look at the tech side, you can kind of see it from an angle that there's going to be a lot of risk in that area and a lot of problems that tech's kind of overcoming. Yeah. And you just look how easy it is today. Steve Suarez sent me an NFT, and I'm, I'm, I was just yeah. out of the blue, and I was just like, I don't even do this. He's having to teach me how to do it. And I'm thinking, <laughs> this is crazy how we're getting here. But it's, um, it's yeah. a wild area to be in at the moment. And, and there, there hasn't been a really great film that I've seen yeah, about that's regulation. What I'm this yeah. is, I gotta write my screenplay, somehow make it exciting. I know it doesn't. I'm excited by the topic <laughs> because this is how you affect uh, seven and a half billion lives. Yeah. But, but it, it's a lot of people, when they hear regulation, their eyes close and they fall asleep. And, you know, like, well, this is affecting <laughs> everyone in this room is impacted by multiple regulators and regulations right now at this very second <laughs> from how your voice or in might be used like there's a video oh, oh you can't see it here yeah the video of the classroom what happens with that video right you're protected by gdpr as well as other regulations with what happens with that video right now in other days someone could have used that done facial recognition on you and said aha you're interested in fintech i'm going to send you a scam link from a prince of an unnamed country who will <laughs> seek for your help in their fintech startup <laughs> or ask your money but, either one. Yeah. but it's um it's a great point because i look at it maybe not from this angle but the pace of innovation this is where i want to get to from my yeah, next yeah, point yeah. but just quickly when you look at it where we are today and what it was when i go to my parents and i say what's happening in the world it can sometimes be a tricky conversation with them to explain how things can happen and how they can yeah. happen so quickly but you look at it when i'm older or hopefully getting to that age with kids they'll be able to see videos of me while I was 21, 20, while at university. And to me, that's kind of harrowing. But that's innovation in its own kind of way. Yeah, yeah. So I want to ask you, because the last yeah. chapter of your book, yeah. great chapter around responsible innovation. Yes. And there's a gentleman in there, AJ Ajay Bala. Bala. Ajay yeah, Bala. Yeah, yeah. What is it around responsible innovation? You just touched on it, but yeah. how is that an important factor and why do Absolutely. we need to consider it as people and as businesses? Yeah, so, so, so Ajay is, is the president of MasterCard's Cyber and Intelligence Division. All right, this is the fastest growth division in MasterCard. It's uh, the most profitable. Um, I think it contributes, if I'm not mistaken, something like 40% of MasterCard's profits. Uh, and um, uh, so Ajay spends a lot of time thinking about your information and how to protect it, right? He's saying AI has gotten into the cyber game. And so, you know, there will be artificial intelligence driven attacks on the entire MasterCard network. And if they don't have their AI responding in kind, then they can lose you know, a lot of money very quickly because a cyber attack will happen in 40 countries simultaneously. Right? And so they have to defend you against it. You don't see any of that. You just know when you walk into the store, you want your transaction cleared in a matter of microseconds. And you notice if it takes more than a few microseconds. Forget if it takes more than a second. If it takes more than a few microseconds, you're like really annoyed that MasterCard didn't let you buy that pack of gum. And so they have to handle that extreme of rapid response and also rapid defense. Um, and, and so in doing that, he's also sitting on a lot of very, very, very private data about how you live your life. We all have gone digital, particularly after COVID. COVID blew out the last holdouts against the digitization of finance. Use of cash decreased 50% in three months. Use of digital increased similarly. The laggards, you know, if you think of a tech adoption curve, it's kind of sigmoidal. And so the people at the end of the curve, the sort of the tech laggards finally came in uh, and, and started using digital finance because they had to, because there was no more cash because we weren't seeing each other. It was all remote. Um, and and so, uh, so MasterCard has been dealing with this massive influx of additional volume and, and you know, how to protect you and how to protect your data and saying, you know, when we innovate around this stuff, like there are certain things you want to just automatically happen around your financial experience. Like when you travel, you don't want to have to put a travel notice on. You just want MasterCard to know that you're now in Ibiza mm -hmm. and should be able to buy your, you know, mocktail in Ibiza. But it has to know a lot about you and your travel patterns in order to detect that it's actually a legitimate transaction when you've gone somewhere else. Yeah. 
And so um, how do they do all this, right? And, and, and so the principles that Ajay talks about in this chapter, which are very important, uh, and it's just a sketch, right? This is a very fast read, it's, it's a few pages, but it introduces some of the concepts of privacy by design and security by design. So when we're innovating with your information in financial services, when we're using AI algorithms to make your lives better, from day one, we need to be thinking about privacy and the privacy implications. From day one, we need to be thinking about how do we secure that information so that once we've you know, taken all that data about you and turned it into something that's useful for you, it doesn't get stolen by a hacker and turned into something that's not useful for you, like the ability to steal your identity because now they have all this information about you, right? Yeah. So, so, so these, and, and then the last piece that relates to the first two, uh, and it's something I care a lot about, we've talked about this, yeah. is, is governance. Yeah, huge. Right? How do we make decisions about our decisions? If we're going to allow a certain algorithm to do something or not do something, a governance function will look at should we use that algorithm or not, right? If there were better governance around data, I argue, um, uh, the, two, the election campaigns uh, for Brexit here in the UK and, and for the US presidential election 2016 in the US would not have been influenced by Facebook because enough people inside of Facebook would have said, we should not do this with our AI algorithms. Unless you think I am being alarmist or overstating things, I encourage you to read my last book, Augmenting Your Career, where I provide some substantiation around the claims that, in fact, AI algorithms and misuse of data and bad data governance directly contributed to tipping the balance. The votes were very close. That's a political failure. But the fact that the vote went in a direction that was against the will of the electorate was a an governance and algorithmic failure and, and a, a failure of the ethos of Facebook primarily. And yeah. so we want to avoid doing that again. And that's where responsible innovation comes in. Yeah, such an important point as well. And you think as well to what David said, whenever I look at something, how quickly we can get annoyed that a transaction is not going through. If it actually is fraud, how quickly you become annoyed by it. How quickly the script flips from being very annoyed that the transaction hasn't gone through quickly to thinking, where's my protection as a consumer? That's why I bank with you. And I think that's such an important, uh, important area. How do, you, how do you make that responsible? Yeah. But um, yeah, that's been a brilliant conversation. I'm uh, really looking forward to uh, talking more about this. Yeah. But it's, uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure to, to interview and have, a, have this Thank conversation you. around it. And should we, should we take one or two questions yeah. from the audience to, to wrap up? We have like five minutes, maybe. Anyone have a question? Yeah. I'm quite interested in this idea of ethos of a company versus regulation. Yeah. Because we all knew that GDPR would need to happen. Um, I had more, more emails about Viagra in my Hotmail account than you know, most people should at 12 years old. So it was obvious. <laughs> yeah. And it's pretty damn expensive retroactively. But the idea of regulation implies people won't behave well at least to me, unless forced, the ethos implies that there is a, there's a reason, a value to behaving well. Yeah. What is this relationship? Do we need regulation or is there a way to cultivate ethos? Right, so, so I'll, I'll answer this in two parts. By the way, regulation is not just punishment for doing bad things. It's also clarity, right? One of the things that has been holding the UK back around crypto and blockchain is a lack of regulatory clarity. It's even worse in the US. Bermuda, on the other hand, has a lot of regulatory clarity, and they just announced that they're launching a stable coin and their first digital bank in 50 years. Their first bank in 50 years. They have clarity, makes it easier for entrepreneurs to start companies, make it easier to attract capital. A lot of good things come with regulation providing clarity, because you know where the boundaries are. Now you can design to them. Um, but in terms of ethos, yeah, I mean, regulation only carries you so far. And so you need other systems in place that actually change how people behave. How do we all learn that we should be nice to each other? Yeah. How do we all learn to, to, to say thank you and please? We grew up with certain ethics being instilled in us at a young age. You, everything you needed to know, you really did learn in kindergarten. And, and the problem is when companies lose sight of that, people know what the right thing is. And, and often if you give them a chance, they will do the right thing. But Sometimes I lose sight of, of what's going on, right? The engineers in 
Facebook, by and large, did not say, I want to destroy democracy. They just were given a task and they tried to implement that task. And afterwards, many Facebook executives have gone on the record of saying, I'm so ashamed of what we did. We destroyed the fabric of society. That's a quote. And so, you know, they would not have done that if they had a greater awareness around the implications of their actions. So, you know, I hate to use words like education, but um, you want to change social norms in an organization. And that's something we all want to think about as we are part of an organization uh, or start an organization that, that we, we make sure that, that the behaviors that we're modeling and that we're encouraging uh, are actually the ones that we want to see in terms of outcomes. Yeah. You had a question as well. Yes, uh, lots of questions. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking forward to the book. Choose your favorite question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I'm most interested in the discussion between regulation and design. So yeah. we have a lot of these global technologies now, cryptocurrencies across the world, and different countries will regulate in different ways, yes. and they're likely not to harmonize. And they're likely to do it at different speeds as well. Uh, I almost agree, but keep going. Um, do you think it's better to try and influence design of the technology, so seeing how it's developed, instead of trying to influence the regulation necessarily, because it'll have a bigger impact globally. Hmm. All right, well, I did ask you to ask me a hard question. <laughs> um, so, so uh, uh, we're colleagues. I said, ask me your hardest question. <laughs> so, um, uh, so, so, so let me you know, kind of take that in a couple of parts. First, first of all, there is a, an iterative conversation going on right between the design of a technology and the regulation that govern it, governs it. So uh, um, part of the reason why uh, the US government did not intervene in 2014 around Bitcoin was because it was still nascent. It was still evolving very rapidly. And so what they didn't want to do was regulate too early and then screw things up in some other way. Like New York State regulated too early. They created something called Bit License, which ensured that New York City, at the time the financial capital of the world, would never be the fintech capital of the world. <laughs> it's just like a colossally stupid and economically costly move by the New York State regulator. And so, um, so you want to have this educated regulators understanding more than just a little bit about the thing that they're trying to regulate. Um, and you want the design to be responsive to regulatory principles. This is why Dialogue, why convenings are so important to bring people together. This is why it's important to participate in FCA tech sprints, by the way. If you guys are entrepreneurs, go to participate in an FCA tech sprint so that you can talk to the people at the FCA and hear how they're thinking. And they will learn how you're thinking. These are good things because it'll make sure that by the time the regulation comes down, they've at least taken your perspective into account. They might not necessarily obey it or follow it, yeah. but at least they're aware of it. And that is incredibly important for getting effective regulation that doesn't screw up design. Yeah. Um, Professor, um, last October, the open day that I came to, um, it was your lecture that I listened to that sort of um, made me decide to come to Imperial. To oh, wonderful. My... Welcome. <laughs> so I'm a big believer in FinTech and uh, the impact it'll have. Um, the thing is, um, I consult for many companies in the developing world. Yes. And um, I didn't get a chance to ask your opinion last time because okay. the time was a bit brief. So I have a conundrum that I'm looking for an answer for. Quite Let's soon. hear it. <laughs> Live case study. Oh, this is good. <laughs> the thing is, um, Wait, hold on. so I have many friends. Shirt sure, sleeves. <laughs> We're working now. Um, OK. So the FinTech, AI, robotics, increasing in technology in the Western world. Yes. Very fast. And you mentioned that there are CEOs and companies who are developing products and services and it touches billions. It does. Okay. It touches billions in the developing world as well. Yes. But the thing is, you know, plants that are doing garments and manufacturing plants, these places will most likely be the first places that we will lose jobs. Um, due to AI and automation, and um, <laughs> I know firsthand that they will, yes. because most companies consult on this. So, so the question is? The question is, mm -hmm. in your opinion, because most of these countries don't have a backup for these people who lost, lose jobs, in your opinion, how could these loss of job could be mitigated yeah. with the use of fintech in these developing nations? 
So I'm going to uh, amend your question a little bit in giving my answer. But but okay. So the question is, so and to put some stats behind this. Um, there are 2.2 uh, manufacturing jobs that are lost for every robot we put into a garment plant, manufacturing plant. Right. Far greater impact in the in in a place like the UK. There's 1.3 jobs lost for every robot. In the developing world, it's 2.2. It's a massive disproportionate impact on the poorest segments of the population that badly need these jobs. Because, oh, by the way, we have to create 600 million new jobs, according to the World Bank, between now and, and roughly uh, 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 2037, just to avoid widespread famine in Asia and Africa. All right, so, so we need more jobs, and we're in decreasing the number of jobs so that I can buy this shirt for a little less money. Okay, so sorry, I'm quicker and quicker. Yeah, yeah, faster too. And so uh, um, this one was made by a human, but I have other shirts that are built by a computer, and they, they fit okay. Um, and and so uh, um, <laughs> to to a guy with a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? So I'm an educator, so I'll just tell you education. But but that I mean, it's a flip answer. So it's not a fintech problem per se, although part of the answer could be a fintech answer. Um, but the question of how do you address this uh, uh, economic disparity that is going to be injected into the global economy through the rapid adoption of AI and, and other technologies um, is we need more and better national skills programs. And we can actually use AI systems to improve learning outcomes faster and better uh, uh, when implementing those national skills programs. So in the interest of disclosure, one of my private sector activities is running a digital learning company that uses AI to improve learning outcomes. And our focus is on working adults who need to reskill because of digital transformation. So I'm in the middle of this right now in my private sector activities, but I am doing it because I believe in it. Because I think it's actually important that we fix this problem. And it is a big problem, I agree with you. But, but the more we can do to help A, reshape policy towards actually giving people a new job via upskilling them versus having them lose work and then they're, you know, at best on public assistance. That, that's the, the sort of the tech answer is we can use AI to help them learn a new skill faster, maybe from a place like Imperial. Maybe we can democratize education. And now someone in an, you know, who might be making a dollar a day could get an Imperial class on some higher skill thing and make 10 or $100 a day. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. The FinTech answer is, um, you know, we, we have to come back to the grand experiment of the universal basic income. I have mixed opinions on this myself, but it is a topic of some debate. And do we need to also have some social safety net as we throw hundreds of millions of people out of work? And I, I say yes. How long it exists is another question, which many people will argue about. Yeah. I think you are over time, though. Yeah, and I'll just add to that, though. It's a good question, but you can also flip it as well. So last year, I was at AI Summit. Next week, I'll be speaking with the UK Ministry of Defence, and they come to me with the same question. It's always an educational problem, and that's why we exist, to educate. And if you look at fintech in particular, there's all these jobs being created, and they can't fill them. Like, it is a struggle to get people into these data science roles, into these data engineer roles. So although it is potentially in some areas taking it away, and I don't discredit that, you can flip it and look at it, well, how do we educate people to go into these roles that are being created through data, through machine learning through a lot of areas that I'm focused on and that itself is a big problem because you're thinking if that doesn't work all these systems and technologies that we love so much they're not going to operate not going to run and it's going to hinder any upgrades so I always struggle with that question as well on, on the other side it's a... so, so so we are at overtime so I, I think we'll we'll release you to to network and also pick up your copies of global fintech uh, I'll stick around if you want an autographed copy uh, and uh, thank you so much for coming out tonight Thank you.